This is the lecture for module five, and for the next two modules, we'll be reading Bruno Latour's book, Facing Gaia, eight lectures on the new climatic regime. This is probably the most ambitious book that we will read this semester. Bruno Latour is trying to do nothing less than uh, bring forth a new cosmopolitical uh, vision for the people of Gaia. He's trying to summon a new political body, the people of Gaia, who would be capable of becoming sensitive to and responding to the complex loops that characterize the Earth ecosystem, really the plurality of Earth ecosystems within which we are, as human beings, embedded and utterly dependent upon. Latour um, is known, or at least was known, primarily as a um, sociologist of science, or um, you might say a anthropologist of science. And what he made a career doing was looking at uh, the work that is done within scientific laboratories to understand how modern people construct scientific facts. So he looked at science as an institution with, with its own, um, you know, cultural values and um, ritual practices and its own way of um, enacting worlds. So each laboratory enacts its own worlds in concert with certain uh, measuring instruments, certain mathematical formalisms, certain um, networks of information exchange, and that within these these networks of machines and funders and experts, science is able to produce really robust facts. And Latour would come to argue that scientific objectivity really means that the producers of whatever fact is under discussion have been able to respond to all objections. Objectivity is the ability to respond to every objection. So a fact that is well made would be able to respond to objections. Uh, so Latour was criticized in the 90s uh, in the midst of what came to be called the science wars, where um, some people in the sciences became very suspicious of what they referred to as post-modern relativism. And Latour, along with uh, Gilles Deleuze and Jacques Derrida, and some others were labeled as postmodernists who denied the objective nature of scientific knowledge and who were relativists and social constructionists, right? And Latour uh, always felt, as all of the so called postmodernists did, horribly mischaracterized by the objectivists or the realists or whatever we want to call them, perhaps the modernists, the moderns would be the appropriate term, Latour felt mischaracterized because for him, um, his constructionism is not social constructionism in the old sense of, um, you know, what we've been critiquing so far with help from, from William, William Connolly, this notion of sociocentrism, where human beings don't actually access a real world or a natural world out there. We're locked within this closed system of signs within this um, language and the linguistic communities to which we belong. And any meaning that we make always occurs within that system. And when it refers to something outside of the system, it's really just pointing to another sign within the system. So we have no access to a nature in itself. What Latour has always been trying to do and what he's, you know, perhaps clarified better in his more recent work is to draw us out of this um, kind of Cartesian epistemology wherein a mind would come to know, a subject would come to know an object. He wants to bring us beyond the image of nature that was produced by perspectival painting in the Renaissance, influencing Descartes and others, such that nature came to be viewed as though it were behind a uh, 
a grid work and that nature could be quantified and um, mathematically reduced into a simpler form of causes and effects where everything in the effect is already contained in the cause such that knowing the initial conditions would allow one to mathematically deduce the consequences at any point in the future. Latour wants to break us free of this um, Cartesian epistemology so that we can come to ground science instead in its institutional networks, right? So away from an epistemological proof as the basis of science to instead looking at the robustness of the networks within which scientific facts are produced and theories are uh, produced. He thinks that this is a better defense of science and nowadays when the community of scientists uh, internationally, especially climate scientists and earth system scientists have to deal with climate deniers and climate skeptics and this whole interest group funded by the oil uh, companies that has raised suspicions about the veracity of the climate models using the old Cartesian skepticism to, to place doubt um, on these models and their predictive capacity. So this, the climate skeptics now have come to use the very proofs that the old Cartesian form of science had once used to support their activity. And so Latour wants to shift scientists into recognizing the best defense they could have of their climate models is to open up the doors of their scientific institutions and show how the facts that they produce come to meet all the objections. They're pretending that they don't have a political stake in the data that they produce, particularly about the climate. And Latour wants to, to say, look, climate science, look, climate scientists, the climate deniers have declared war on you and your facts. And it's a political war, right? So if you're gonna try to pretend to have access to a pure nature and um, try to keep your hands clean of political dirt, then you're gonna continue to lose this war because you don't recognize that you are at war, right? Your enemy has declared war on you and you're pretending like um, you're above the fray. Latour thinks it's time to declare war and that once that shift in orientation uh, has taken place, that the scientific community will be able to squash the oil lobby and the other um, interest groups who, for reasons of capitalist profit at the end of the day, are denying, distorting um, the science so that the modern way of life can continue um, unabated this notion that we can master nature through industrial technology such that human beings could come to dominate uh, the planet for our own uh, interests. What Latour wants to point out is that um, we need to find a new way of inhabiting this planet if we hope to continue to inhabit this planet. So he turns to the figure of Gaia in order to do this. And I apologize about the lighting. Um, one of the difficulties of recording lectures at night I have found is that it's very difficult to get adequate artificial lighting. The sun is, is really, it's the best game in town. Um, it's hard to beat that. So Latour turns to the figure of Gaia and he wants to distinguish Gaia from um, an overly mythologized notion of, of a goddess. Um, he points out that even in, in Hesiod's myth, his cosmogony, Gaia is not a goddess. Gaia is a force from the time before there were gods. Um, Gaia is co evol with these other two forces, primordial forces from b before the time of gods and goddesses. Uh, Eros and chaos. So even mythologically, Gaia is not a goddess. So let us not think in um, 
sort of new age way about a, um, a mother nature who cares about us. That's not the Gaia that Latour is referring to. If anything, Gaia comes to declare war. Gaia comes with a sword, not as a nurturing mother. Similarly, Gaia is not nature, as modern people have understood this term, this idea of nature. Um, Gaia is not a system of laws, right? Gaia, Gaia is not a unified um, oarsman. Gaia is not the engineer who is steering the Earth system, right? Instead, Latour will refer to Gaia as the effect of a contingent cascade of historical events. So when we think about Gaia today, we might point to oxygen, we might point to the atmospheric um, constituents like oxygen. And what we have to remember is that um, oxygen isn't just a constituent of the atmosphere, you know, that happens to be in homeostatic balance right now. Oxygen is in the atmosphere because uh, a few billion years ago, an organism started releasing oxygen as part of its metabolic process. Anaerobic uh, organisms, uh, prokaryotes, started um, releasing oxygen as a byproduct, and this started to accumulate in the atmosphere, and it was poisonous to said prokaryotes and life, other life forms on the planet, and it wasn't until more complex forms of life, eukaryotic, aerobic organisms evolved that could breathe in this oxygen, that um, the Earth's atmosphere was able to stabilize, relatively speaking, in a homeodynamic way, if not a homeostatic way. So oxygen is the consequence of a historical event, a spontaneous emergence that continues to exist in the atmosphere only because that those organisms continue to live, right? So there's this complex interplay between you know, a seemingly inert molecule in the air and a living, breathing agent or all the living, breathing, organismic agents that, um, that breathe in oxygen. What used to be a pollutant has become, for these organisms like us, um, an energy source. So Gaia is the result of, like the oxygen crisis two billion years ago, Gaia is the result of these contingent events that accumulate over the course of geological time and, you know, a complex homeodynamic metabolic um, set of relations has emerged through a series of feedback loops that, um, you know, are more or less organized at this particular moment in history, but can be thrown out of whack at any moment. Um, so there's certainly some degree of harmony in these feedback loops, um, these, these atmospheric feedback loops, geochemical uh, feedback loops, thermodynamic feedback loops, but there's no sort of capital P providence guiding them towards some ultimate capital H harmony, right? That's the whole reason for the urgency of the ecological catastrophe. Right, you know, and Latour says, basically, his his work on on Gaia in this book, Facing Gaia, is an attempt to um, provide us with some pointers as we face the the great ecological war and the way that ecology and our awareness of our ecological situation um, f is forcing us into a profound mutation in our way of life down to the smallest detail. And, you know, Latour is not sure if, if actually we're too late. Um, he thinks that we need not progress, the dream of progress, we need to let go of that. We need instead to um, adopt the perspective of a need for regress. Um, no, no more sustainable development, but rather sustainable retreat, in other words. Um, and one of the ways that he gets at the significance of, of Gaia, 
this um, plurality of interpenetrating, interrelating, evolving organisms that we live within is Latour will talk about the reverse symmetry between Galileo, who was one of the, the fathers of um, modern science, right? And a 20th century scientist and engineer and chemist, James Lovelock, who coined the, the term Gaia theory to refer to what nowadays is also, is also called uh, Earth system science. And where Galileo was able to cancel this medieval um, distinction between the sublunary sphere and the heavenly spheres, just like, you know, later with Newton, one gravitational law was declared to be universally applicable, both terrestrially and celestially. Like, for, for the ancients, for the pre-modern European people, philosophers and, and natural philosophers and scientists, um, there were two kinds of physics. Celestial physics that deal with the immaterial heavenly spheres and how things move up there, and terrestrial physics, with, which deal with m m physical, material things. Galileo and, and the other modern scientists did away with this distinction. So in its place, in the place of the um, celestial hierarchy and this distinction between a supra-lunary and a sublunary sphere, was um, infinite homogeneous space, empty space. So this old dualism was wiped away by Galileo, but in its place, there was a new dualism, that between primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are the things that scientists measure, um, things that can be quantified and that are physical, mass, motion, uh, extension, and so on. Secondary qualities are all the things that, as Galileo put it, are sort of added by the subjective um, perceiver. Um, things that aren't really real, that are just projected onto the really real primary stuff. So colors, scents, sounds, purposes, values, and so on. So the old celestial terrestrial dualism is is washed away, but in its place is this, as Whitehead refers to it, this bifurcation of nature between the primary material qualities and the secondary uh, mental or, or psychological qualities. Lovelock, now, just like Galileo, who turned a cheap telescope to the sky to discover the craters on the moon and the, the moons of Jupiter, Lovelock uh, was part of a, uh, was working with NASA to figure out how best to detect life on Mars. They were gonna send an uh, expensive Mars lander to uh, test the soil and like, well, what do you look for? And Lovelock said, we don't even need to go there. We can look at the atmosphere of Mars, see that it is in chemical equilibrium, and thereby determine that there is not life on that planet. Because when life inhabits a planet, such as we find on this planet Earth, there's a chemical disequilibrium maintained. Uh, the atmosphere exists in a chemical disequilibrium because there's another agent present, namely living organisms that are um, working actively to uh, sustain that, that disequilibrium. That, uh, as Donna Haraway will come to call it, when we read her book later this semester, um, that sympoetic process, not autopoetic, where there's autonomous individual organisms separated from one another, maintaining this sharp division between inside and outside, but a sympoetic process where organisms are each internally related to one another. There's an interpenetration of these agencies such that, you know, in Latour's terms, we're dealing really with waves, waves of agency that move through communities of organisms. Agency is no longer something that belongs to an autonomous subject. Agency is redistributed. Agency is discovered in relationship uh, in, in Latour's Gaian metaphysics, which is largely uh, drawn from Whitehead's process relational cosmology. So 
Lovelock by pointing out that the Earth as a living planet exists in this chemical disequilibrium. And so when we look up at Mars and do a spectral analysis of the light coming from its atmosphere, we, we know already that, that, that life isn't present there, or at least it's not widespread and will soon be extinct. And this led Lovelock to recognize that there's something very special about this planet. And it doesn't seem like any other planet, at least that we can tell so far. Maybe there are some moons here and there where there's a disequilibrium maintained by some form of life. We just haven't detected it yet. But in any event, the, the, the Earth is a very special planet. And Lovelock, in effect, um, re-institutes uh, the sublunary distinction. There's a thin film of life on this planet that makes it somehow different from the rest of the solar system, where physical and chemical processes can be said to be at work. Physical and chemical processes that um, science at least pretends to have more of a handle on, even though at that level there's no certainty anymore, right? In the mid-19th century, science already gave up on absolute certainty and instead adopted a statistical or probabilistic understanding of nature. And then in the 20th century with quantum theory, it was recognized that this probabilistic um, nature of nature is not just an artifact of our way of understanding it, nature, not just an artifact of the limits of our knowledge, but in fact nature is creative. Nature is um, chaotic and not a law-abiding system, right? So Lovelock, Lovelock reestablishes the sublunary sphere, and he also reanimates what, what the modern scientists had deanimated. He reanimates the earth by pointing out the effect of these agencies, these organic agents, namely that the planet is maintained in this chemical disequilibrium that happens to be more conducive to life. So what Lovelock ends up doing is reestablishing the terrestrial celestial distinction and washing away or dissolving the bifurcation between primary and secondary qualities. All of a sudden, it's the secondary qualities um, of the perceiver and the agent, the purposeful organism constructing its own environment. Those become primary. So there's a reversal, right? Um, and Latour will, will thematize this as a, as a turn to aesthetics in ontology. And so, again, part of what I'm trying to articulate in this class, this course on pluralism, is this notion that we live in a universe that is aesthetic through and through, right? So its, it's appearance is all the way down, in other words. And there's no um, thing in itself beyond the appearances. So we're in the cave, and the cave can always go deeper. The appearances can always be unveiled to reveal something more beautiful, something more intense, something um, that, that sheds new light on what we thought we had understood. But there's no escape from the cave, right? There's no escape from the aesthetic relations that we are engaged with and that situate us historically. Um, so Latour tries to defend Lovelock from some of his critics, mostly neo-Darwinian neo critics who imagine evolution as though it were explained by a competition among individuals in um, a changing environment and that organisms really have no agency in this process. They're passively selected by the environment. And those organisms that happen to survive are the ones that we, we see today and that the speciation that occurs is um, no fault of the organism, right? In the sense that the organism isn't the one deciding to change in a certain way. That would be a Lamarckian idea, right? So the neo-Darwinists look at this notion of Gaia and think that Lovelock is suggesting that Gaia is this new 
kind of um, providence, this new kind of harmony toward which all organisms naturally tend. And Latour will say that this isn't what Lovelock is, Lovelock's idea is at all. Um, Gaia is fragile in Lovelock's view. Um, and what allows Gaia to emerge is not this sort of all-powerful imposition of a grand whole that then has an effect on the parts. Gaia is the emergent result of the activities of countless agencies. So rather than one capital P providence, Latour will speak of many lowercase p providences, and each organism has its own providence, in other words, its own purpose. So teleology isn't this cosmic thing imposed from the outside. Teleology emo emerges in a creative and pluralistic way. Each perspective brought forth in the evolutionary process. Each creature that evolves has its own purposes and strives to realize those purposes, but not just as a separate, isolated individual, right? But as a sympoetic, symbiont participant in a co-evolutionary process. So one of the ways that Latour draws upon Whitehead's ontology is that, you know, for Whitehead, each actual occasion of experience um, unifies within itself the perspective of every other actual occasion of experience and then adds its own uniqueness to that, that community, that, that society of other occasions. So there's a way in which each actual occasion is inside of every other actual occasion. There's an interpenetration or an internal relation among all points of view on the world. And Latour brings this into biology and points out how the evolutionary process is one wherein organisms are not passively selected by their environment, but actively constructing their environment, right? This is called niche construction theory. And in a sense, there really is no environment because the environment is other organisms. And so organisms are um, constantly creating one another. They're creating their environment, which means they're creating other organisms. Sometimes we create other organisms and shape them through relationships outside of our skin, and other times organisms that were outside of my skin end up inside my skin as part of me, right? This is what Lynn Margulis calls symbiogenesis, and the, most of the organelles within our eukaryotic cells used to be free-living organisms, and at some point, um, our cells tried to eat those other cells and ended up not digesting them and figuring out how to work together to do this thing we call being alive. So we're all inside of one another. We're all mixed up together, and the evolutionary process is not individuals, not primarily individuals competing with one another. It's primarily um, communities uh, evolving through these waves of action that give rise to surprising emergent effects. Right, so what we think of as Gaia is the effect of these many agencies, and they seem to be co coordinating more or less um, sufficiently, but, but that's, that's a contingent achievement, right? And human beings seem to be um, throwing their weight around in a way that's not respecting the, the delicacy, the fragility of that coordination. Um, as we learned from Connolly in the last module, it's not as though humans are the first ones to, um, you know, crash into stuff and knock things over. This planet is, has not been in a steady state, harmonious uh, evolutionary process for the last few billion years. It's been extremely chaotic, full of catastrophes. But after each major catastrophe, mass extinction event, um, more diversity has arisen a few million years after than existed prior right, to the asteroid impacts or super volcano explosions. So somehow um, the creativity of, of the biosphere seems to find a way to survive. So that's what we're here trying to do as one of the species of this, of this planet.